Shabbat Shalom. Page 1076 in your Chumashim. Somebody who would like to uh, read for me. This is chapter 15 of the book of Deuteronomy. It's where we started this morning, but I want to see if you were paying attention. 1076, or chapter 15, if you are playing along at home and you have a different Chumash with its own page numbers. Chapter 15, we talk a lot about poverty legislation. What does it tell us in verse number four? There will be no needy among you. There will be no poor people. What does it say in verse number seven? If there are needy people among you. Wait, there will be no needy people among you. If there are needy among you. And verse number 11. There will never cease to be needy people among you. There will always be poor people. Okay, so in the span of seven verses, we go from, there will be no poor people, but if there are, and yeah, there always are going to be. Now, I, I, I know that some of you may have heard of like biblical criticism, the idea that the Torah was written by multiple authors over mul multiple centuries. It's a nice topic to have for another day. But come on, even the clumsiest editor must have noticed that in seven verses, he went from saying there would be no poor people ever to being there are always going to be poor people ever with a small detour with an if squeezed into the middle. What in the world is going on in this chapter? And you, I'm sorry, you cannot explain this by saying different authors had different opinions or he wrote chapter or he wrote the first few verses and then he went out the next day and noticed there still were poor people and so he had to keep writing and didn't go back to change the original. What is going on with this chapter? The ideal and the reality. The ideal, of course, is there will be no poor people. The reality is there always are poor people. So what's the point of saying the ideal if there always are going to be poor? Or, or another explanation. Another explanation. The varacher. different layers there. Let me repeat them, especially for those that couldn't hear without the microphone. So on the one hand, perhaps this is an entirely conditional statement that there could be no poor people if you follow the Mitch vote. And if you follow the Mitch vote, when there are poor people, this is how you will stop them from being poor people. That there should be no poor people as long as you're following the following procedures and the following procedures are telling you what to do if there are poor people to make sure they are not. It's kind of like saying nobody has to have um, bad teeth. If you have bad teeth, go to the dentist and they'll get fixed. Does that mean your teeth will never go bad? No, but it means no one has to live with bad teeth because there's a solution. And that solution is good oral hygiene and a nice dentist. Uh, we can recommend a few from the congregation if you're curious. <laughs> and within Israel, that would be one standard, and that would then become a beacon to the world that other people would recognize, especially those in need, that, hey, <laughs> there's a good system over here, and let's try and either emulate it or actually move to that system and see what it can do to fix this problem. But that then raises the very real question, of, but what is the actual solution to poverty in Judaism? How does Judaism fix poverty? How does Judaism make that there shouldn't be any poor people, but if there are, here's what we're going to do to fix it actually work? And the most profound way it does, and the least intuitive, 
because the rest of us can figure out tzedakah and tithing and leaving the corners of our field for people to eat. You know, that all kind of makes a certain intuitive sense. But if you really want to blow minds, we look in chapter 15, and what is the rest of the chapter about? Canceling debts and letting people off the hook for any loans. And when we look at other places on top of that, the jubilee return of property to the original owners. And this is like the thing that makes economists' head spin. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. OK, hold on. So every seven years, your debts are getting canceled. And you think this is a good thing? You think this is going to cause economic productivity? You think somebody who took out a loan and now they're not able to pay it back should just have a uh, hand wave? What about the poor schnook who gave the loan? What about him? Uh, he had the wherewithal to, to, to extend, and now he has lost it? How is that going to help the society? And, and even better, you tell me, every 49 years, with the, the jubilee, every seven sabbatical years, every seven, seven, that we do this with a giant reset button, that we flip over the monopoly board, put all the pieces back out as they were at the start, give everybody $200 or whatever, the, you know, that's one of each, isn't it? I can't remember the monopoly rules. You get your monopoly cash, and then we all start off again? How in the world does that make sense? I mean, think about the process in which a person gets into the situation whereby all of this would happen, right? Put yourself back 2,000, 3,000 years, we're all agrarians, we're all farmers, right? Maybe some sheep, sheep herders, that kind of thing. And you've got a few bad years, right? There's a, a, a wolf that is just destroying your flock, or you have a, a, a terrible uh, flood that comes through because of the breach of one of the levees, and it's flooded your field much more than anyone else's. All of your crops are gone. And after one or two of these types of disasters, you've had to take out loans to be able to reseed or re restock your flock, but there's another disaster and you're not in a position to repay that. What do you do in the end? Well, chapter 15 kind of talks about the consequences of that. Eventually you throw your hands up and you say, all right, like a monopoly, I'm out. I I'm gonna declare bankruptcy. And that means I'm gonna have to sell myself. You go into indentured servitude. Uh, slavery is the term that's used in the, the translation we have, but it's much more nuanced as I uh, mentioned at the beginning of my Torah introduction. You sell yourself into indentured servitude. That means you've already sold your land, you've already sold your assets. The only thing left you have to sell is your pre-assigned labor to somebody else for a fixed period of time. Um, and, well, how are you going to get out of that? Sure, the person you work for might give you enough free time that you can pick up some piecemeal work on the side, eventually make enough money to pay back that debt, and then you can get back on your feet, maybe, and climb out of that hole that you are in uh, from the circumstances that you have faced. But let's be honest, what is the more likely situation? What is the more likely outcome of once you've had to sell all of your land, all of your assets, and the only thing left to sell was just you? You're staying there. You're stuck. Right? You have been put into a hole. Maybe you dug it yourself. Maybe the, the environment dug it. Maybe the, warrior, the warlord next door that rampaged through the country dug it for you. One way or another, you are in a hole, and you are at the mercy of someone else. And the odds of you ever being able to climb out of that hole are very, very small. So what does the Torah say we do? Just shovel in dirt after them and say, sorry, you lost. What is the real fear? That one person has messed up their life or had their life messed up for them? No. The real fear is multi-generational trap. The multi-generational indebtedness to this servant status. That somebody will end up condemning not only themselves, but their family to generation after generation of deeper and deeper debt and deeper and deeper obligation to someone else and not gaining access to any of the means that would allow them to pay off or, God forbid, actually thrive within the community. So what is the Torah's solution? The reset button. The Jubilee. Yes, for 50 years you can have these problems. For 50 years we'll let this go on because we're not going to 
intercede every time something goes wrong, because to do so would be too disruptive. But every 50 years, we are really, really going to reset things. And I don't just mean canceling debts. I mean, if you've been an indentured servant up to this point, you are now free. And as you saw in the Torah, you're going free with gifts, right? Tell our, tell our contestants what they've won, Bob, right? You're going out with something that is good. You're going out with the, the, the assets that will be needed to reboot. But more importantly, you are being given back your capital. Uh, economic theory, capital are, is the means of production. In the agrarian world, that means you're giving back your land. Now, this is the land that you sold probably way back at the beginning of your financial troubles. You may not have set foot on it for 50 years, or maybe you were forced to work on it for the person that you had to sell yourself to. But that land belonged to your father, to your grandfather, to your great-grandfather, going all the way back to the time of Joshua. That land was your inheritance, your share of what God's blessing was for the people. Because ultimately, that's where the land came from. Uh, you didn't deserve the land because you were such a wonderful guy. Your grandfather didn't deserve the land because he was so heroic at some point. The land was yours because God had said, you all get a share of the blessing that I'm giving to you. And you lost your share. Maybe by your stupidity, maybe by your ancestors' stupidity, maybe by natural disaster and other problems. But that doesn't mean that you are alienated from the blessing God wants you to have. And if we allowed it to continue in a perpetual trap, then you would be. Then your blessing would no longer be accessible to you. You would have been blocked from the gift that God wants you to have. And the Jubilee was God's design to make sure that people would A, not be trapped in this multi-generational pit, B, have a chance to reboot themselves and get their life going again with the wherewithal to actually make that happen. And C, a big old reminder to everybody in the world that they don't actually own anything. God owns it. You're using it with God's permission. And if God wants you to give the corners of your field to this person or give back the land that you bought to that person, well, then you do. Because it's not yours. It's not yours. And God can reassign that to anybody as God chooses. And God told us how that reassignment would work. We just read about it in chapter 15 and many other parts of the Torah as well. Now, this is a radical notion in the modern world. Uh, the, the equivalent in the modern world would be to say something like, just imagine, since most of us aren't farmers, that the primary means of production, you know, factories and, and goods and services production companies, imagine they all have shareholders. And every 50 years, we add up all of those shares and we redistribute them to everyone. Right? So all of us are going to get an equal share of Google, Apple, whatever. Every 50 years, it's going to be redistributed. Now, if we blow our shares, then we could end up on the poverty scale. If we have catastrophe and disasters, we could end up on the poverty scale. But we know that in 50 years, there's going to be that big reset. And at least our kids or our grandkids are going to go back to having equal access to the means of production of every other person in this country. Any odds of that getting, it through, uh, getting that through Congress? <laughs> I don't think it would happen. I'm not entirely sure it needs to happen because you'll note that the, the reset button that the Jubilee is talking about here, this is the nuclear option of economic redistribution. And it's not meant to be necessary. It's meant to be the last ditch effort to prevent multi-generational indebtedness and, and people being trapped in a cycle of poverty from which they can never escape. But it's not supposed to come to that. It should be by the time we get to the Jubilee and we hit the reset button that nothing changes. Because everybody is where they should be. Everybody has access to their family's inheritance and the blessings that God wants for them. That nobody has been trapped into a cycle from which they need to escape. And that's what all the rest of Judaism tries to do to prevent. The nuclear option is there only if we have messed up everything else and somebody has gotten trapped. But all of the acts of tzedakah, 
all the acts of, of tithing, of, of giving from the corners, of the forgotten sheaves, and all the other ways that Judaism says we take care of other people, we help get them back on their feet without waiting 50 years, that we help them get out from a crushing cycle of debt that is going to make them, their children, and grandchildren in a more miserable situation than any person should have to live with. We do that before we get to the Jubilee. And by the time the Jubilee comes around, we just all have a big party and nothing has to be changed. That's the ideal that the Torah wants for us. So we may look and we may scoff at the impracticality and impossibility, uh, not to mention the selfishness that would prevent the Jubilee from ever happening in the modern world, but recognize that it is precisely that selfishness that this chapter and other parts of the Torah are talking against about not hardening our hearts, not turning a blind eye, not ignoring the cries of the poor, because God is not going to ignore their cries. And if we ignore those cries, well, as the Torah says, it will be counted as though we sinned against them. Ignoring those in need puts us in the same category as those who put them in need. Don't make God take the reset button in hand. So it eventually had to happen with the destruction of the first temple. And the land got 70 years of rest for the 490 that had been neglected. We don't want that again. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>